Okay, so the the title of this guy is Living Landscapes or How to Design Native Plant Gardens That Attract Wildlife and Still Look Good. So as a designer, this has been one of the things for me is that so many people when they when I talk about native plants and how I love native plants, you know, a, a response is, oh, but you know, aren't they messy? And you know, you mean that like crazy Berkeley gardening stuff? And you know, and I'm kind of like, well, you know, so I think what I've been trying to do is as a designer, how like really the main focus of my research is how do you create gardens that are aesthetic, that people are attracted to and love and want to like emulate and copy that are still doing good ecological things, that are still promoting biodiversity, that are encouraging beneficial insects, that are doing that sort of thing, but fall within this. There's there's an amazing article by a woman named um, Joan Nassauer, who's a, um, a professor of landscape architecture. And the, the name of the essay is, I think it's called um, Messy Ecosystems, Orderly Frames. And basically what she's saying, and I just think this is such a great way to start thinking about these sort of things, is that if there are these cues to care, if it show, if you're showing that, you know, you're, it's not just let's throw out natives and then we're done and we walk away and it's all messy. But if you, if it's within borders, right? So if it's got, if there's edging in there, or maybe you've got um, a shrub that's hedged and then your natives are in within that area, or even just showing that you've, you've cleaned up, that you're maintaining, that there are paths, that there's orderliness. That's a really great way that so many people aren't quite ready like we're still set in this paradigm of lawns and foundation plantings and to get people to start embracing native plants really we need to kind of work within that existing paradigm start move things over slowly and then soon people are going to be able to say oh my god yes i want to put in the pipevine everywhere um, or whatever it is, but let's do it sort of slowly and let's fit it within the cultural ideas that we already have. So that's kind of the basis of um, where I will be going with this. Um, so increased biodiversity, right? Why? Ah, there we go. Um, what is it that we want to do? Why? What does increased biodiversity do, right? So big things, Creation of migration islands for species of in insects and birds. Improved urban habitat, right? If you look at ecology and if you look at what scientists are studying, really there's, until relatively recently, people were focusing on like the restoration areas, the rural areas. They were not focusing on urban areas, although now we're starting to see urban ecology. And they're certainly not talking about suburbia, right? That's sort of left to the side. But if you think about all of the lawns, all of the residential sprawl that's going on, I mean, so much of our landscapes are in suburban landscapes. And so if we can add biodiversity there, then we can help stabilize some of these native and local populations. And I'm sure, like, I'm not going to go into this in huge, I'm preaching to the choir, right? Like, this is one of the things. I've got a great audience here. I'm sure you know a lot of this stuff. So I'm going to keep the, like, why are we doing this and why is this so important short? But just kind of to, as a reminder and to say, it doesn't have to be in parks. It doesn't have to be in, you know, these large, vast areas that even just starting in our own yards and kind of doing this matrix across yards, across neighborhoods is going to do a lot of things. So protecting the native and endangered species and using these habitat gardens for the creatures that that like are having a tough time, right? Like ground nesting birds, you know, where where do they go? How do they survive when the lawnmower is out to get them? Um, so some of the things in terms of enhancing a garden's ecological biodiversity, right? What are just some basics that you can start thinking about in terms of garden design? So plant type, um, mixture of types is gonna be huge, right? Really plant biodiversity to get biodiversity, but also thinking about them in big clumps and thinking about like, if you've got clumps of the same species, that's gonna be more attractive than the one of everything kind of thing to 
your insects and birds, but height is going to be huge. You know, having variation in height, you'll hear people talk about planting in layers and that's going to be really important. Um, you know, what the foliar mass, what are the different types of foliage, the root depth, soil composition is, is part of it really like to the extent that you can keep native natural soil, that's going to be really good. And then in terms of improving biodiversity, it is this idea of surface and material variation, you know, and I laugh about every picture that you see when they're talking about the habitat garden or the ecological green roof or whatever it is, has this one like damn log there, you know, like they bring in this weird dead branch log that's there for habitat. And so I guess one of the things I want to focus on is how do we get away from just the like, okay, this is now a biodiverse garden because I've got this log here. You know, it's, it's this weird little log in the middle of my design so that the insects can use it. Um, and so, yes, you want something like that and you want perches, but how can you do that in a, in a good looking way? So, you know, one of the main things to do is, is think about these niches, right? And designing in layers. And this, what's cool about this is that when you compare kind of some of these biodiversity guidelines, they really do fall in line with a lot of the guidelines for planting design, right? When you're thinking about planting design, you talk about planting in layers. It's not like this was one of the things with my students in their presentations. They were noticing that a lot of these suburban yards, it's just one level. Everything, you know, was a foot and a half tall across the entire yard and that's all it was. And they were like, no, you need more height. You need the difference. And so aesthetically, we want those different heights. For biodiversity, we also want those different heights. So we want to think about the ground covers, getting up a little higher with the herbaceous plants, thinking about shrubs and then trees. And then another one of these uh, biodiversity ecological principles is the idea of edges. People like insects, your wildlife, they love the edges. They love it where two different sections meet. Um, that's where like all of the dynamics happen. So meadow and forest or grassland and chaparral, right? Those are the areas where it happens. So again, thinking about those layers and where you've got things meeting. So it's not just a monoculture and it's not just the same thing across there. Um, and then choosing plants, right? So in terms of improving ecosystem services, like plants that are known to provide nectar and pollen are gonna support insect diversity. Um, one of the key things is this idea of plants that bloom at various times of the year, right? So if you're talking about planting for, um, and we'll get to this, but planting for bees, they need to have a source of pollen all year round. And so, or to, you know, they want to get, they want to get that pollen. And so you need to have something blooming at all times of the year. And I think oftentimes we get caught up in this like moment in time and especially, and, and I will throw landscape architects under the bus all the time because we make these mistakes, right? We think about just that flash point, right? Like that perfect, how it's gonna look in spring when everything's in bloom. And then we neglect to think, to think about the winter or the fall or any of these other seasons. We've just got like that one aha moment. So really thinking about what, you know, what plants will bloom year round um, and then native plants are going to attract more native insects and birds, right? It makes sense. These plants have co-evolved together. And so that, yes, while there are a lot of plants and you can find that, you know, lavender will bring in a lot of bees, there are, if you plant an areogonum, the amount of insects, the native beneficial insects that you can get with that is just phenomenal. I mean, like, especially, and I'm, and I'm saying the areogonum, the buckwheat, because it's, it's there in front of me, but it's also, you know, here at the, at the UC Davis Arboretum, we've got some of these massive buckwheats and you go in the middle of the summer and they're just covered in insects. And they're, and it's not just like the typical bees and, you know, and the ones that you always see there, there's some really, really cool ones. Um, so then like specifically thinking about, you know, okay, so I want to design for birds, right? I'm a birder. I want to bring more, more birds into my backyard. Um, what do I need to do? And so the log again is a great thing. We like the perches. So if you can have that, that log or some variation of a log, um, thinking about like larger stones, this is where boulders come in. Maybe you've seen like the boulders that have the little dips that where you can put water in there. I mean, awesome to have that. Um, again, food during different seasons, local soil to encourage healthy invertebrates, 
Um, and then the same species clumps. This is a this is a similar kind of thing where birds are attracted to kind of clumps of the same thing. And as we know from design, that really is going to kind of pull people aesthetically more so than if, if your eye moves sort of from clumps or swaths through your garden, that that's more restful to your eye. That evokes more of an aesthetic peacefulness than if it's just like boom, 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 and it's all over and it's one of everything and your eye is just like going crazy and doesn't know where to stop. And the one of everything also makes it feel a little messier, right? And so if we're trying to kind of control a garden, but still have the native thing going, clumps are a great way to do that. And then some leaf litter for birds is also really good. Um, and, you know, you can go back and forth, all of these. And, and, you know, we can talk about all of this afterwards, right? Because there are going to be things where it's like, you know, mulch or not mulch. And do we want to just use ground cover everywhere? I mean, I was just reading somewhere where um, this guy, Larry Warner was saying, don't remove weeds, just cut them off at the base because as soon as you remove them, you're messing up the soil itself and you're, you know, pulling up the seed bank. And so you're gonna get more weeds, right? So there's all sorts of stuff we can discuss about that. And like the leaf litter, do we want the mold on there? And, you know, remove some, leave some for the birds is kind of what I'm thinking. Um, and then, you know, hummingbirds are gonna be sort of that, that specific, right? That's the sexy guy. And so, you know, some of the, the these hummingbird plants to think about, like you'll notice they're purple, they're, they're purpley red, they've got, they're tubular. So, and I'm happy to share any of the, you know, to share this presentation. It's also gonna be recorded. So don't feel like you need to like race and, and write down all of these names. Um, but your different ribes, like the different currants, the different epilobiums are fantastic hummingbird uh, plants. Uh, Salvia spathaceae is, you know, hummingbird sage, um, the aqualegia. So thinking about those, there's, Actually, if you ever do come um, or in the UC Davis area or in the Davis area on your way to Tahoe, that's when people <laughs> go to Davis, I've learned. The only time people stop in Davis is on the way to Tahoe. Um, but if, if you're stopping for a bathroom break on the way to Tahoe and you want to walk around the, the Arboretum, we do have a new hummingbird garden. And it's a really cool garden because it was actually planted with someone from the vet school. And so it's someone from the vet school who studies hummingbirds. And so we're using part of the um, Arboretum teaching nursery as a place to tag these hummingbirds. And then we've got tons and tons of different hummingbird plants, a mixture of native and, um, and ornamental plants, but a lot of native plants in there. And it's just, it's turned into such a fantastic garden. So that's, that's sort of an aside of, of a place to, to come visit. So hummingbird plants are some. But then designing for beneficial insects, right? And this is where, like, we got to start thinking about the, the not sexy insects, right? Like, we can move, butterflies are awesome, you know? Like, let's talk about moths. And, you know, ladybugs are cool. They eat the, they eat the aphids. And, you know, we've got all the bees, like, super sexy and, and fun, and we're saving the bees. But, I mean, think about, like, there's a whole, or, like, family of bugs, the, the myriad bugs, right? These are the plant bugs that eat plants. And then we've got our lace wings and we've got thrips and we've got, you know, like the thrips that we like, they eat spider mites, right? So we want to encourage those to get rid of our spider mites. We want like pirate bugs are going to come eat aphids, right? So these are the things we, like we can do good things in our garden um, if we encourage these other beneficial insects. So, you know, a lot of the things to think about, right? Insects are providing food for birds, bats, fish, frogs, 96% of terrestrial birds raise young on insects. So this is mostly caterpillars. So we really, we want to bring in those caterpillars so that we can feed the birds. And I mean, I don't know if any of you have either heard Doug Tallamy speak or, um, or have read some of his stuff. He, um, he gave a talk to California Native Plant Society that's available on YouTube. I can, I can share the link um, after this if, if anyone's interested. But it, really, he's all about like, let's design for the caterpillars so, the ca so that the, you know, the birds can eat the caterpillars because this is really, really important. These are the things that we need to think about. And then like these other predatory insects, which will eat the other insects to keep the you know, pest insects under control. 
And so what are the plants that attract those pest insects that then attract the predatory insects and, and thinking about that. But then also the insects are providing these decomposition services. They're breaking down the waste. They're doing all sorts of really good stuff. And so like that's been one of the most fun things for me is I mean, I'm so far from an entomologist. Like I wrote down the, the thrips and the lace wings that's all over here on the side so that I wouldn't forget which ones they were because I, I remember butterflies and, and ladybirds or bugs, but I love, I love the entomologists and I want, I want to be, you know, friends with them. How about that? <laughs> right? I just, I want to incorporate that sort of stuff because those are cool stories. And those are the kind of landscapes that I want to design where I'm like, oh my God, check out this, like the Stachys bellata, which is the, um, the pinkish looking flower there. This is, it's a really cool plant because what it does is it attracts, um, a predatory insect, and I can't remember which one, but it, that eats the white flies. And so the white flies go to this plant and then the predatory insect eats the white flies. So if you plant the Stachys bellata near your vegetable garden, then you can keep out some of the white flies. Ugly plant, right? It's not that pretty. Sometimes it can look pretty, but it sort of gets leggy and it's not that impressive. But this is another one of my, like Haven's design tips. I am all about taking plants and tucking them away right? If they do good things, there are areas all around your garden, kind of like my mullet garden that I was talking about, you know, tuck it away in the back where people don't see it, where it can be effective, where it's doing things. Use your showy plants to, you know, be out there to the world and look at me and I'm all fancy. But then you've got little alleyways, you've got little places, you've got under the showy places, put in these other plants that do amazing things but may not like be the star of the show. Um, so some of the things to think about, again, we've got our log um, for nesting. Uh, so sunbeaten logs, rotting logs for all sorts of invertebrates. Beetles are also unsung heroes. Boulders and bare soil are, are really cool. Um, spider species, you know, I mean, another one that we don't talk about and they do really cool stuff. Um, and then, like if you want stories for your garden, sticky plants, right? So like your columbines are so awesome in that they give off and then, um, oh, what's the other one? Um, oh, it'll come to me. Um, but they're, they're these sticky plants that give off this stickiness and essentially what that does is that traps the little insects, right? These predatory insects that the plant doesn't want. They get trapped, the big insects eat them, the plant is saved. And you can look at like, honestly, if you get a chance and you've got some columbines some wild columbine growing, native columbine, look at it and you will see all sorts of little insect, insects stuck on there. You didn't even think about it, right? But now you've got people coming to your house, you, you know, post, post COVID where we, we've moved on from that. It's, it's done. We're all like vaccinated, life is good. And you are showing people your achalasia your columbine and you're like, check this out. And it's just covered with insects and they're grossed out, but it's this amazing story. And they're telling their friends, like that's the kind of garden I wanna have, right? And it's a beautiful plant. It's this beautiful woodland, orange, bright colored plant that also tells a story. So here are some of these insect plants. Um, you know, Grindelia, Media, that's the one. Media elegance is another one that's sticky. And so you start looking at that and you can see, again, all of these cool little bugs, you know, little critters and insects that are on there. Um, but your Mimulus, your, your Baccarus, Monardella, all of these are plants that attract the insects. I mean, the yarrow, right? The Achalia. Man, that is one that is on every single list. Like I'm, I'm starting to get a little sick of the plant. Um, just because it's there all the time, but it's a beautiful plant, right? It's like one of those plants that looks good in the garden, can be kind of tamed and kept in check, doesn't get too wild. Um, you know, there are native species beyond just the plain white one, and you're bringing in all sorts of good things with it, right? So it's like everyone needs to have yarrow in their garden. Everyone needs to have a, an areogonum, a buckwheat in their garden. It's just one of those things like, you should do it because it's there are these solid plants that do all sorts of really good things and they look good, right? This is another thing that's important to me. Um, for gardening for bees, so you'll see I am keeping in some of the sexy insects too because they're sexy. Um, 
So foraging sites, I was talking about early spring to late summer, right? So you want to have that wide variety of blooms so that it lasts that whole time. So while, you know, a wide selection of wildflowers, that's where you can get the forage habitat. That's where you get what you need. And um, there have been some cool studies out of UC Davis. There's some really cool bee people here. Uh, that talk about like what are some of these wildflowers that are really good. Neil Williams uh, is uh, one of has been the the PI on these. Um, he's an entomologist and he does these amazing plots of California native annual wildflowers and is seeing has actually been studying and find like looking to see what are some of these. Um, and I think I'm trying, I can't remember which one was the most popular. I think it might've been like vinegar weed was one of the more popular ones. Um, there's some, there's some cool things, but you can look it up. I, that's also a resource that I'm totally happy to share, right? Because this is the other thing. As a designer, I want plant lists. I want people to tell me plant this, this is it. And that's why I'm putting these up here because it's one thing to be like, oh, ecological, let's do this good stuff. But unless someone's telling me like, here are my things to use, it's just like over my head, like, yeah, I wanna do the right thing, but you know, I want lists, I wanna get started. Um, so why does he, uh, designing for bees? 1600 species of native bees in California, which is crazy, right? I mean, I, was, I started naming my native bees, I could get to like five and that was on a good day, right? There's so many and they're so cool. And like, yes, the, the honeybee is awesome and we want to you know save that but think about these native bees and these ground nesting bees and like all sorts of cool ones right and so the native bees actually do visit certain crops um so we don't want to just focus entirely on the european honeybees even though they're doing some some very cool and important stuff and we definitely want to to promote them as well um but focusing on bees beyond just just those honeybees so for here are some of the design specifics, right? So small mounds of coarse sand is habitat for the mining and the solitary bees to nest in. And again, this is something, this does not need to be as you walk in at your front door, like front and center, here's my earth for like the bees. This can be tucked away. This is in a little corner. Maybe this is over like where your hose bib is, right? Like connected to your house. Maybe you just leave a little area where there's no mulch. Um, but use that space. Thinking then about wildflowers, right? The continuous bloom from spring to late summer. Like I get frustrated this, like with wildflower seed mixes. Uh, A, because I've had people come from and talk about like the importance of local ecotypes, right? And how you want these, like we're planting California poppies from seeds that like aren't even from California, right? We get our generic California poppy seed pack and it's not even going to be from our watershed or let alone from, you know, like even a larger area. So ideally, we want local ecotypes if we can get them. But even more so, like I get frustrated with the with the seed mixes because of this whole idea of the clumps, right? We want to have clumps of flowers. And in nature, you don't have a perfectly hybridized thing of of plants, right? When you think about how plants grow, they grow, they seed, and that creates a little more of a clump. And then over there, and so you're getting these clumps that spread as opposed to like spread equally across the whole thing. So when I buy seeds, I actually, instead of just mixing them all up, I kind of try, I'll do one and then I'll do another and I'll try and keep them in clumps initially because I think that works really well visually better than sort of the, the image down at the bottom where it's just like all spread out across the whole thing. Um, but thinking about perennial and annual seeds and also ephemerals that will thrive in your local climate. And one of the things that I've been learning um, recently just through talks and reading is this idea of, you know, plants are gonna do well where they want to do well and we can't really force it, right? We can start and we can try and we can do things to sort of disturb the earth to try and promote growth from seeds. But if they're not happy there, it, it, we just kind of have to say, throw up our hands and say, okay, it's not gonna work. But maybe they're happy over here. And maybe two years later, they'll have found that little area of developed soil and then the seed will come up. Um, 
So really kind of this, this idea of like, let's work with what we have and try and put plants where they will be happiest. And if not, let them find those happy places and keep experimenting ourselves to try instead of replacing the same plant that dies over and over and over again, maybe it's time to try something else in that and really experiment. Um, so primarily native plants for, for bees. And then, you know, blue, purple, violet, white, and yellow are the bee attracting ones. And then I already talked about um, clumps. I've talked about that a lot. So, so here are some of the, the bee plants. And again, like when you look at their lists everywhere, this is another thing that I do. I just collect lists and I have, I have lists from, you know, Sonoma master gardener lists of things. I have lists from, you know, CNPS lists from the Arboretum folks here in Davis. It's like, this is what I want to do is get as many lists as I can. And then the reality is that's a starting point. And I would always get frustrated when people would say, oh, well, you know, it depends. And it, it really, it, it's where you are. And it's the microclimate because I want, I just want someone to tell me, I want them to say, these are the ones. But the reality is take all of these lists, get them all, and then just start testing. Like, even, I mean, you know, I, uh, one of the things that I really enjoy is, is green roofs, right? I've done a lot of research on green roofs and finding the right plant palette for green roofs in California has been a challenge because so much of the research on green roofs has been done in Europe or in the Eastern US in places where there is a lot of um, regular rainfall. And so what I do is any place I can like the dog house that I have, or uh, I built one of the student projects here in the courtyard, we built a um, bike enclosure. So like a bike, I don't know, it's not even a shed, but it covers bikes basically, shelter, there we go, and put a green roof on that. And I'm just testing, I am just testing everything I can. And I'm gonna say, I'm doing it with seeds, I'm doing it with plugs, I'm doing it with you know four inch pots and seeing what works going, starting with these lists that I get, starting with, you know, a presentation like this and saying, okay, I'm going to start thinking about Cascade Creek goldenrod and let's see how it does. Cause I think that's really, if all of these plants are going to be unique to your microclimate. So start and then see what actually works. Um, and then butterflies, right? And so there is this potential for rare species conservation, right? Pipevine swallowtail, bay checker spot. The main thing to remember when you're designing for butterflies is, is the target population close enough to where you are, right? So like the bay, the bay checker spot, one of the stories that I remember is when the, the California Academy of Sciences, they put their green roof up they actually included plants for the, the bay checker spot. And they, you know, there's this big talk about, okay, we're using native plants, we're gonna bring it in. But the reality was that the closest population, the closest like viable population couldn't fly far enough to be able to make it to the green roof there in Golden Gate Park. And so even though they had the plants, it was, it's not quite like if you build it, they will come. It's like, if you build it, they will come if they're close enough to be able to fly to it. And so thinking about that kind of thing or bring introducing some of the species that you're trying to, but thinking not just about monarchs and uh, pipevine swallowtail, but thinking about like some of these, these moths, some of these other things, and thinking about the caterpillars and the food that the caterpillars need um, to, to survive and to turn into the butterflies. I think we make the mistake a lot of time that we just think about the butterflies and, and pollinators when, you know, something like the pipe vine, um, you know, the, the caterpillars, like it just, when you see them go on these pipe vine, um, eat, you know, eating it up, it's just insane, the damage it does. And, and so the amount of the plants that you actually need to, to have that viable population. So, you know, I just said that include the primary food plants of the butterfly caterpillars, um, but also plants that provide nectar. And as I said, make sure that those um, desired populations exist. So here are some of the, the butterfly plants, right? So the, the pipe vine, the Aristolochia californica, um, different types of asters and erigerons and uh, buckwheats, eriogonums, and then obviously if you want to bring in the monarchs, uh, having the milkweed, the Asclepius. Um, for us, 
in Davis and like most likely in, in your area to the, the fascicularis and the speciosa are the ones that are most um, common, you know, and, and utilized in for our area, most native to the area. Okay, so this is the fun part, I think. You, you have these ideas, right? You know, like I've given you sort of the design ideas, things about thinking. And so now it's like, how do I put them to use? And like, how do I put them into cool garden typologies so that they look really good, so that they're fun, so that people are excited to see them. And it's not just like that weird like log there that's sitting there that, you know, because now it's this bio garden or this eco garden, I've got my log and, and you know, check, I've done it. I've done my habitat garden. So this is where it's like me trying to say, what can we do to make these look really pretty and kind of fun? So sustainably chic gardens. And you'll have to forgive me, I was, I was in a phase where I was loving uh, alliteration. So there's a lot of that in the titles coming up. Okay, Marvelous Meadows. And so, I mean, people may be familiar for, for meadows, I think, the best way to think about meadows and, and creating a naturalized garden that that looks beautiful, that doesn't just look like messy and haphazard and, you know, like side of the road sort of thing. Um, if people are familiar with Pete Udoff's principles, one, what he talks about is setting out a matrix of grasses. And so that goes across the entire area. And so it's really evenly sort of spread out grasses. Then once you've got the matrix in place, you want to think about swaths. And so these are like the clumps, right? These are bigger groupings of plants, again, in your threes and fives and sevens or larger, fifteens, whatever, that kind of move through the space. And so your eye follows those along, right? Maybe you've got a clump up here or a swath that goes like this and a swath that goes through that. Um, but those are, are they move your eyes across that matrix, but they're kind of, you know, it's not just like dancing. Then you do want to add a few of the dancing plants, right? Those are the scatter plants. And the scatter plants are the ones like, if you look at Udoff Gardens, like it's always an allium, right? It's like this one big ball that's popping up. And so thinking of those scatter plants, like what are they? They're, they're kind of the accent plants. And so you wanna have those just sort of, they look like you just tossed them through and they're just popping up where they are. Um, and so that is what he describes as a really a good way to create what looks like it's a natural, naturalized kind of garden, but it still shows those cues to care that I was talking about. It's still, the hand of man is very much present within that. So, you know, the matrix with the swaths and then the scatter plants. And then another one of the tips that, that he has is this idea of empty spaces with annuals, right? So some of your perennials, your swaths, they're gonna take a little while to fill out, right? You're putting in a bunch of um, salvias and you are putting them in and they're in four inch pots and you've made sure that they're you know three feet on center. This is not gonna be that wow factor that you want right away. So putting like scattering a bunch of poppy seeds or using a bunch of other California native annual wildflowers is a great way for the first year or two to get the color. And then as your plants that you've put in, the perennials are really coming up, getting bigger, um, you know, and through succession anyway, mostly these native, the wildflower seeds, they're only going to last a little bit. And so then the ones that you really want, those are coming up, they're becoming, you know, stronger and more dominant. And then that's going to be the focal point in your meadow. And then stunning swales. So this is the other one. This is an area that, again, I'm spending a lot of time in research trying to come up with plants that can work in California swales. If you look at any of our swales, any of our rain gardens, all people are using is juncus. I love me some juncus. It's a great plant, but it is not the only thing available. And when you look at any list of green infrastructure plants, planting for bioswales, all of them are generated from Europe and from the East Coast. And they're in places where they have the summer rains. 
and what happens here and I because I was recently like I'm, I'm actually trying to do research on this and that, so I was looking for citations and when you try and look for things in western gardens essentially what people say is well they require irrigation that because a plant will require supplemental irrigation then we do not recommend it well part of our reality is that we live in a climate where you may need supplemental irrigation for most of our plants and it's a garden and i understand like we want to get to a point where we don't have it where where we don't necessarily need it um and i think we're all trying to get to that but if we're doing things and we're trying to capture storm water and we want our plants to look good and you know we want gardens and we want our gardens to function as more than just capturing storm water then using a little bit of irrigation i don't think is such a horrible thing you know if we're using drip if we're trying to minimize it and so what i've been doing here at davis is really start focusing on like what what could this plant palette be and so we've got one area where we're using most it's mostly like typical ornamentals right and so we've got um we've got Lomandra in there and we've got Salvia Shemadrioides and we've got Sedum Autumn Joy, like typical garden plants. And they're being planted in lines across a bioswale so that you can see how do they do at the top, along the edge, and then along the bottom. That was our first iteration. Our second iteration that would just went in um, this fall, actually like less than a month ago, these are, are all California natives that are easily um, purchasable that you can find at local nurseries. So it's it's like your red buckwheat, it's um, Penstemon um, Margarita Bop, it's Verbena Lilicina. You know, it's, it's the ones that you know that you can find that people have said, oh, these are our Californias that, that we're trying. So we're trying those. The next iteration is going to be the ones that are maybe more local to our watershed, more, you know, really sort of you, you'd have to either grow from seed or have to be able to look. And we're just going to see what works and just start playing with them. We're looking, you know, at the same time, um, just, you know, it's, it's an easy experiment, but it's, it's just kind of getting an idea because we don't have that palette. It's if that's the plant list that everyone's asking for. What do I put in a swale? What do I put? What is the plant that can take all of this water inundation, you know, in the middle of a storm, but also can go without water? And I think we focus so much on that water inundation when the reality is that even in the winter, even in our bad storms, it's not that much water, especially now with, with sort of climate change that, you know, we're like, oh, it has to be a plant that can do it all. But it really just has to be a plant that can tolerate water for a little bit of time. It's not like constant wet feed. So um, that's kind of some of the stuff that I'm thinking about. So this goes to this idea of experimenting with plants, right? So the grasses, the rushes, the sedges, the reeds, use that as a base. We do know, like we know the juncus, we know all of these different ones. This is a California native plant garden. Um, called the Gateway Garden at the Arboretum that was designed by Ron Lutzko. And all of the plants in it are local to the local watershed. So really, but used in sort of a really well-designed way. You can see the swale, you can see moving things around. Um, again, annuals for color. Uh, thinking about fall color too is a great thing to do, right? So. The combination of Epilobium aster and Solidago is one of my favorites for fall. I just love kind of the, you know, the red, yellow, and purple just adds that color. Um, and then there are a lot of grasses that are recommended that will clog the swale and crowd out other plants, um, like Carex barbari is one of those, that can be good if that's all you want it to do. But if you want to have other plants as well, then really like thinking about, does it play well with others? And how, how does it do? Um, handsome hedgerows, right? This is another area, so much fun, right? We all have 
privacy screens and there's so many hedges think about like you know between your neighbors or in front of your house and why do we always use the same plants right the pittosporums the ones that we know that are easy and can be hedged and look you know boxwoods and and you know loris nobilis like all of these things we have some amazing california native plants and some of them can even be hedged Right. Another one of the lists that I've, I've been like trying to find. I've got I've got a list of, you know, California natives that can be hedged. And so let's use those. And I mean, the hedgerow is one of the best places for habitat. Right. This is the, for the birds, for all of the little critters down there. We're talking different layers. And I mean, is there anything better than a row of ceanothus in the spring? I mean, like, think about how cool that is, or coffee berry, or, you know, there are so many different things. So it's thinking about how can we creatively use some of these wonderful, wonderful hedges in maybe more um, traditional ways, as opposed to just saying, oh, well, you know, our California natives will just have our clump one there, or our one ceanothus. Like, can we play with it so that it fits in with our suburban neighbors and that it, it just, it's doing its good thing, but it also looks fantastic. Um, you know, so as you do it, like think about the wildlife. So the idea of designing in layers, and this is another experiment that we're gonna start playing around with where we're putting in a typical hedgerow as designed by, you know, people who do restoration ecology and then I get to do my pretty hedgerow <laughs> where I'm going to be using like similar species and the lower grasses and plants and flowers and front perennials at, in the lower layers are going to be more clumped as opposed to just seeded and mixed, um, but playing around with it so that I'm still, you know, meeting these requirements of providing food, creating shelter and nesting sites. But how can I do it in sort of this more traditional way? Um, and then marvelously modern. Uh, so, you know, this is one of those typologies that I think is, is really the most fun to play with. You know, I was talking about how I have a class of students and their assignment that I just gave them yesterday, they were all given a different typology. And now what they have to do is they have to design a typical suburban garden using that typology, but only using California native plants. So someone is do it has to do a modern, you know, architectural garden. Someone has to do a cottage garden using only California natives. Someone was assigned to do um, a Japanese garden, right? Only uh, native plants. And I think this is the kind of thing. I mean, I love this kind of challenge, right? Because it puts me within a boundary. Like when someone's like, "Sky's the limit, go for it." That's when I'm like, "Whoa," you know, like it, that. That's hard. Give me some limitations and then I can start thinking really creative, cre creatively. Let's go with that. Um, you know, so how can you think about like insect hotels? Like what a beautiful put insect hotel or bee hotel or whatever you want to call it. You know, using equisetum along the edge of a pool. This on the right, this was, um, I told you that I was working for that company, Miraday. This was our entry for the uh, San Francisco Garden Show where a couple of years ago, where what we did was we had, we, you know, we took a tough shed and we created this really sort of modern palette. All of the plants are in very straight lines and we have, you know, our, um, our concrete pads kind of going up to the front of the house and we borrowed furniture from Flora Grub. I mean, we, you know, got all fancy. We did our gabion, but all native plants. Right. So how do you change that typology when you think about a modern garden, you're not necessarily thinking California native. So really playing around with that. And I think that there's some fantastic potential with that. Right. So thinking about like to do that. Yeah. So you can see like there's the front vision of that. But you can see the idea of like the hard edge. Right. Really for for the modern. That's where it's all about like orthogonal. It's all about pulling out lines from the house, getting those right angles, like keeping the modern, but then you can have a little softness with the plants, right? That contrast is, is, is huge and can really make everything seem stronger. It makes the, the right angles seem stronger and then it makes the plants seem a little like more flowy and fluffy. So concrete pavers, gravel, 
um, you know, one tree or shrub that acts as a focal point that you're, you know, that's what you're looking at. Maybe it's a CNO this, maybe, you know, maybe it's a really cool manzanita that you've got. Um, but use those straight lines, you know, edging of paths, groupings, keep those in the single species, you know, steel and metal. I thought the, this was, is another insect hotel um, where it's all been kind of the, the holes have been drilled in and then it's painted that bright color. And it's just like, that's simple. Like that's a simple way to take something that, that is, is loose and natural. And then you add that pop of color in the straight line. And it just like, it kind of tightens it up, you know, it's like it buttons it up and it puts a little tie on it. And it's like, okay, I'm ready to go like for my job interview sort of thing. So thinking about like that kind of thing, just little elements will, will take your garden up to more of a, you know, modern design. An Asian aesthetic, right? This is another one where this is one of the typologies that I think is so much fun because when I was researching it, like the thing that was so cool to me is that one of the main principles of Japanese gardens is that I think 98% of the plants used are native plants. You know, granted they're native to Japan, but they are native plants. And that the key thing is to focus on the seasonality of the plant so that you have these moments where it's, you know, the iris is in bloom or the cherry blossom or whatever. And then it's, you know, there's, it's the focal point, it's the bark, it's the twist of the branching. And we, I mean, this is an area that we have so many cool California natives that allow us to do all of that, that I just think how, I mean, what fun to really play with that and to have that idea of, you know, the, the aesthetic of the Japanese garden, but only using California plants, I think is, is one of those things that I just, I love the idea of exploring. You know, so, and we've got these iconic plants, you know, the manzanitas, coffee berries, junipers, you know, your sedges, your rushes, the irises, like red bud is that perfect, you know, cherry blossom, right? Just think of it in the spring and that's the only thing in bloom and that you're walking and you turn a corner, you know, another one of the Japanese garden design principles is that you're looking down, they have these right angles and, and like quick turns so that you keep, you watch your feet so that you know where you're going and then you look up and then in front of you is this beautiful blooming thing. And so like, can you imagine like making that turn and then looking up and seeing the red bud? You know, things like that. So flowers that evoke seasonality, otherwise, it's really like using the contrast, like using formal elements to contrast the informal and to make that stand out even more. Um, and wait, did I jump ahead? Ah. Anyway, okay, so um, I think I missed one, but this is the desert garden. <laughs> And so Desert Delights, and it's probably going to be later in my slideshow and I miss, messed it up. But the other one is that we can play around with creating a desert garden. And this is another one of the typologies that my students are looking uh, at. So thinking about in this one, it's individual plants. It's using decomposed granite, you know, as mulch so that you, you get that sort of deserty feel. It's this color palette, right? It's silvers, peaches, oranges that really evoke kind of that light, like those tans and bright colors, you know, focal points for the specimen trees and the shrubs. And then like keeping the seed heads on for the winter interest so that it really feels like that, um, that you're, you're part of that. Um, and then, and then, as I said, I have a special place in my heart for, for green roofs. And so thinking about green roofs and gorgeous green roofs. And, you know, there are, there are studies that say, oh God, don't put natives on, they're not gonna do well. There are other studies that say like out of Texas, they tried the typical sort of succulent palette. It failed miserably. They used, you know, Texas natives and they did amazingly well. And if you haven't gone to the Academy of Sciences green roof, definitely, definitely go because from this top picture, they started with four different plants and it was a, it was actually required. Um, Renzo Piano wanted it to be grass initially. 
And then he was willing to compromise on four species. And they're like, well, we want them to be native. And so it was four species. And then it was basically over time, the, the people who work there have just been adding more and more and more. And they're all native and they're all native to the watershed of sort of Golden Gate Park. And what's happened is instead of this mix, cause it's a tray system that was spread out equally in each tray and across the whole thing. Now they're really starting to play around with those, those microclimates and think, you know, what grows well at the top of a dome versus down in the shady area or the wetter areas. And it's really kind of cool to see how this has all changed and, and grown. Um, and, you know, the, this red tail hawk, I just it put that in there because I think this is one of my favorite stories where in terms of habitat, they're not nesting on the green roof, but year after year, the, they bring their young to teach them how to fly. And so they, all, they bring the, the little babies up to the top of the domes and then let them jump off of the domes and practice flying from the domes, which is, I mean, come on. This is like the most amazing story ever. So um, in terms of design guidelines, like, you know, use the elevation. So habitat, wildlife corridors, like thinking about plants that are rare and endangered that wouldn't do well um, in other places that can thrive. Like there's an amazing example in uh, Switzerland where essentially what they did was hundreds of years ago, they were building like a water treatment plant. And so when they built it, they threw the native soil up on top of the roof because they wanted to keep it cool below. And that native soil had all of these seeds, you know, the seed bank had for um, orchids. And these orchids now can't be found anywhere else. It's like they're on the endangered species list. It's like the red book is what they're called. Can't be found anywhere else, but they are thriving on top of this green roof because they've just been allowed to do their thing. They're totally protected, but they're, you know, there's no one farming. There's no one coming over and building parking lots and that sort of thing. And, and they can just grow and do amazing things up on top of the roof. Um, and so, you know, in terms of the design guidelines for green roofs, it really is all experimental. So these are, this is an, a project that I'm working on um, at Davis. There's an existing miniature, I think it's like, I don't know, maybe 300 square feet on top of sort of a vestibule of the health services center. And so it's, it is, it's on top of the second story and you can access it and grounds services at UC Davis is letting me play on it, which is really fun. And so I've just been testing all of these different California native grassland species. And I just wanna see, you know, things like, um, oh God, uh, all of these different grasses, right? That have root systems that are six feet long that require that purple needle grass, man. Um, how do they do in six inches? Right. And you see examples so far, it's actually doing pretty well. Like they actually can adapt and go from a really deeply rooted system to one that's that's more, you know, spread out. And, you know, Bolander sunflower and media. And I'm just testing, I'm testing a bunch of different seeds. I'm testing a bunch of different milkweeds. And it's all about what will work. And let's see, because I think that that is the key sort of, if there's any takeaway from me talking, it's experiment and, and report back, right? And just see what works and then go from there. Um, and, you know, so these are some of this, there's that bike shelter, the, the, the green roof bike shelter that I was talking about. And different species, the, the poppies on the left, those are from, from Annie's annuals. Um, it's a mixture of, of seeds, there's purple needle grass on there. There's just I'm, every year I'm just adding more things and I'm seeing what works. And, and the yarrow, which I love is taking over everything. So is the, the Columbine. So, you know, I'll pull out some of that and, and spread it out somewhere else, but you know, it's just, it's really seeing what, what is the, the thing that's going to work. Um, so before I take questions, Bonnie did ask me to sort of address uh, the sort of perennial questions of um, soil type and irrigation. And we can talk about these and these are big questions. You know, I know in Marin, in Davis, pro I'm not as familiar with, with uh, Napa, Sonoma, but clay soil. And it's an issue and it's tough. And, you know, 
to add amendments or not to add amendments. And for me, I think I like, <laughs> here's my problem. I'm really easily convinced. Someone gives me a, you know, a good story and I'm like, yeah, darn toot. And that's exactly right. Like, let's add those amendments and let's do it. And then someone else will come up to me and be like, what are you talking about? Like that you are insane. Like we want to use the native soil. Like, you know, it needs to learn how to adapt. And then I'm like, oh yeah, you've got a point there. So what I'm trying to say is that I've got an open mind, but my latest thinking on the to add amendments or not to add amendments is we've got clay soil. We're stuck with clay soil. We're not going to go and amend the whole thing. If we've got like a really showy bed and it's a small bed and we want to try and, you know, it's all about a flower, a perennial that we want to highlight, then yes, let's amend it. Let's showcase it. Let's go for it. Right. But if we're talking native habitat garden, even if we want it to look beautiful, the reality is we have to deal with the maintenance. And we have to think about the maintenance and we have to think about ongoing and can you continually add amendments and do you want to put in plants that are going to be miserable unless you put in amendments. So what I've been doing is this experimenting thing. I am, you know, always optimistic. I'm always testing, saying, oh, I bet this will work and I'm going to try it. And if it doesn't, it's, I feel like it's less my fault and it's more like the plant wasn't meant to be there. So I'm going to try the plant somewhere else. But like, I mean, succession happens and plants adapt and plant, you know, there's so much that we can't control that I feel like we kind of can set it up as best we can and work with what we've got. I mean, I, I'm a fan of adding, um, you know, a top dressing of compost to things. I think that that's a nice way to give an extra boost. But honestly, if a plant needs me to keep coming back and babying it and watching it, like this is why my, so many of my Annie's annuals plants don't make it because I give them the best shot possible. I'll give them the little extra compost that they ask. I'll keep them watered. And it's just like, I'm in Davis. It's the Central Valley. It's hot. They're not happy. Like I'm jealous of, <laughs> of all of you and your gardening climates because you get, you know, you get more plants than I do. Um, but I'm going to try and I'm going to keep trying. So that's, that's where I stand. And then that kind of goes into the irrigation thing too, of like drip, micro spray, overhead spray. And it's another one where I have been taught, you know, it's all about the drip, like use the drip, spread the drip. I will say that for the most part, like with drip, I like the drip in rows. Like I really like creating sort of, you know, headers at either end and then rows that go across that are spaced like a foot and a half apart, as opposed to trying to get little micro drips at each plant. I think that that's really hard to do. I feel like those things always break off. It, it just takes too much requirement. So plant them in a grid, you know, and then your plants don't have to be in the grid. Some can be closer, you can scatter them, but have that grid. And I was also in my front garden, I was convinced by someone to um, put my irrigation, my drip at four or six inches below the soil so that you're actually just like getting the roots, which I think in, in theory is this fantastic thing. I love the idea. In practice, nothing has made me more frustrated because I have no idea. I have no idea if it's watering. I have no idea if it's leaking. If I've dug something out, did I somehow break the line? Like I, it just makes me feel like I don't know what's going on and I hate that. So even if in theory, like maybe an ag, right? I know that this is what they do in like Israeli agriculture all the time. And it's this, you know, inline drip that's buried and it's amazing. I love the idea, but for me, it will never work, you know? And then the micro sprays, that's another one that could be super fun. And like, there is something about overhead spray. Like you see it, you know, it works. It's more like rain, you know, maybe the micro sprays are good, right? Because there is that argument too of overhead versus drip. Overhead is more like natural rain. And so with natives, you want to do that as opposed to the drip, which is where does that come from? And I just, it's kind of what works for you. So I'm just, I'm testing it all. I've got, I, like I said, I've got drip, inline drip in my front. 
some of it is still buried some of it the stuff that i just it wasn't working for me you know i got three you saw the tears um in my front yard one tear is all up at the surface the other two are still buried until i get so frustrated that i pull them up and then in the back i've got the micro spray and i'm using that happily and playing around with it so that's kind of where i fall which isn't like a definitive and i know it's really fun to just get that definitive answer um but yeah that's that that's kind of me and um and questions i'm here now for any sort of questions and this has been really fun so thank you all lots of you for listening thanks haven so why don't you go ahead and stop sharing your yep. screen that's and what I'm so doing. You, there we go. yeah see you full size so we can put it back on on speaker view and then um uh as i look over questions that have come in and then more usually start. so the first question that came in was uh uh well actually you did already respond to one which was the, what was the instagram uh <laughs> name and so if folks go into the chat you'll see uh, uh well go ahead haven you can repeat it too yeah so it's it's at uc davis underscore design build uh, so that's there. And for folks who know how to save the chat, you can do that at the end. If you don't know how to save the chat, there's three little dots down at the bottom next to where it says file. And if you click on those, there is an opportunity to save the chat. And I'll remind folks at the end so you can, you can do it if more things show up in the chat. So the next question that came up, uh, this is probably more of an entomologist uh, question. So uh, I, th I don't know who Judy is, but uh, we have enabled screen sharing for others. And Judy, I don't know whether we've got somebody here who is sharing. Let me see, uh, Judy. Yeah, I don't know who that was and, and she's gone. Okay, <laughs> I was about, about to remove that person. So they may not have been, been paying attention. Uh, so, you know, they do have folks who can get into Zooms and do things that are far more disruptive than that. So the entomologist question, uh, or maybe it's a, actually an ornithologist question was, um, how can uh, they protect caterpillars on their milkweed because they're being eaten by birds? So, and I don't have an answer to that. I mean, on the one hand, it's good because you want the birds to eat them because you're bringing in the birds, but you're also trying to protect the monarchs and you want, you really want them to turn into monarchs. So I yeah, don't Danielle. know. This, yeah. is, this and is the thing with Peter master Gardner, you all here, know. I know you were here earlier. Peter did some research on monarchs for his project for us last year. Uh, Peter, are you still on this meeting and do you have anything to contribute to uh, to how to protect those little monarch uh, larvae. I am still here, and theoretically, they should be able to protect themselves because the uh, the milkweed, as you know, is, is a pretty irritable uh, uh, sap, and uh, by eating the leaves, they absorb. Uh, uh, I forget the term for it right now. But what they absorb into their, their skin and their wings uh, is very toxic to, to, to birds. And so most birds will only eat one caterpillar, uh, monarch caterpillar in their life. And I said, no, thank you. Uh, that was a mistake. So they, they do have a natural defense that uh, should protect most of them from being eaten. Yeah, that's what I had thought. I thought one of the reasons they eat the milkweed is because that that does give them give them that protection. So, so I don't know. Maybe in Mill Valley, Allison has uh, either either birds that have become uh, tolerant of that toxin, or uh, or young birds that have not learned quickly enough. Uh, so let's see, uh, there's a question about the plant. I don't know if it wasn't asked you, uh, Haven, you had suggested a plant that attracted the white fly and then uh, the, um, the insect that would eat the white fly. So which plant was that? So the, the plant was Stachys bulata. So S-T-A-C-H-Y-C-H-Y-S and then bulata, B-U-L-L-A-T-A. And I can't remember which insect it attracts, but whichever it's insect it is. Google it. Yes. Yeah. 
yeah, 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 that's good. And uh, you did offer to share your slides with us. Yeah. And so I will, once I get them from you, and we'll talk about that afterwards, uh, we can do that on uh, through email, uh, I will make it available to folks either by sending it out or by putting it somewhere where folks can access it and download it if they need to, so that uh, those who were trying to take notes were uh, got to kind of breathe in and out and know they would actually get, get something from you and not have to write so quickly, yes. So um, let's see, a uh, question about heteros and wildfire danger. Yeah, and, and I mean, this is, this is a big deal and it's, it's totally legit. What I would say is, you know, if hedgerows, it, and it's with most plants, if the hedgerows are maintained and they're not allowed to get too woody, Right. I mean, there's a balance between creating habitat, but also, I mean, keeping your hedgerows happy and green and any hedgerow that I'm talking about, like especially these suburban ones, I would suggest having irrigation there. And so that you're going to want irrigation to um, to establish your plants and to keep them happy during times of drought. And so then they're not going to be these dried out understory that we hear about, you know, that are causing the wildfires. I would keep them, you know, not up against your house. So it's, it's not foundation planting. It's away from your house. Keep them at, at, at a lower level. And if you're in a wildfire area, you know, there are those, um, you know, it's the circle of distance for, for fire safe planting. So follow within those distances, right? So not right in that first zone up against your house um, and not necessarily in huge areas leading up to your house um, in those further out areas. But with irrigation, I, I don't think it should be an issue. Good, thanks, Haven. And uh, for folks who are familiar with the Indian Valley College campus where they have uh, the organic garden and actually master gardeners uh, have, have a demonstration garden there. I know that our local California Native Plant Society is putting in a native hedgerow at IVC. And I know that our guild's kind of in conversation about uh, how can we how can we support that happening in the area that's near our own demonstration garden. So uh, we'll certainly be looking at some of the ideas that you talked about and uh, thinking about plant suggestions for that, that would be uh, useful plants to have. Uh, so um, next question is uh, your personal feelings about um, mixing other Mediterranean climate plants with California natives. Okay, so this, you know, it, this could be controversial. I always get, you know, like when I was talking with, you know, CNPS before I gave any talk, I was like hiding some of the ornamentals from my slides. I, I am not against using other Mediterranean plants. I think I am definitely pro-native. I want to use the majority of my plants. I really am promoting um, native plants. But like, if you saw my front yard, I've, I've got Spanish lavender in there. I've got like agaves. I, and so the way I see it is it like two ways. One, that the ornamentals incorporating those, I think that that creates the bridge between purely traditional gardening and purely native gardening. And I think that's how you can bring people along so that they'll start embracing more of the native. Um, and I also think that like, and you know, we don't need to get into the whole like what is actually native and all of that. But I think that, that like, so culturally a lot of these plants, a lot of like the lavenders especially are plants that, that do well, that thrive and you do see studies that show that they are attracting bees and they are bringing in butterflies and, they, and that they are doing ecological good. So as long as they're not invasive and as long as they're not causing harm, I don't see why you can't incorporate them. I mean, you know, I'm always saying like this was a fight that I would get in with the owner of, of Miraday. You know, we'd always talk about, you know, I'd be like, I'm not dogmatic. And he's like, I know Haven, <laughs> you said it, <laughs> you know, like, yes, natives are awesome. And what's cool about being in California is that we have a huge palette to choose from, right? I mean, like, it's hard to only embrace natives if you live in Rhode Island, um, you know, because it's not that big a palette. We've got so many. And when I say native, like I could be 
I could get in arguments with people or not get in arguments, but people could fault me because I'm not native just to the, to the watershed, right? I incorporate plants from the Channel Islands and Southern California and like that sort of thing. Be because I just like, I want things to be good looking and pretty. And I, I, I really, it's like, how can I do both? And I think that that is, it's this idea of reconciliation ecology where, you know, it's not reservation ecology where we're just saying, oh my God, leave everything exactly the same. It's not restoration where we're saying we've got to bring it back to the way it was. It's how do we combine the two? How do we work with the fact that there are people and culture and plants and wildlife and habitat? And, you know, if we're adding in an insect hotel, like that red pole that I put in there, it's a little random, but it, it adds that focal point and it does something in it. And it's still allowing the insects into our world and allowing us into the insect world. So that's sort of my, my point on that. <laughs> Good, I, I think that's well said. You know, we've had those conversations certainly in my backyard and my husband has threatened to pull out a giant plumbago that, you know, it, if I had a quail bush there, that would be great, but I don't. I have a plumbago and I have a gorgeous spotted towhee family and they build their nest under that thing every year. And right? if you were to pull it out, you know, what would happen to the towhee? So <laughs> it's it's happier with the plumbago and, and, I, and I will I will tolerate it. Um, so, uh, so let's see, questions are scrolling upward and I know you've been looking at them yourself. So let's see, we got through that one. Oh, um, cottage garden. So you talked about a lot of typologies. You mentioned cottage garden as an assignment that wasn't one of the ones in your slides. So some thoughts on that. It's a, that's a hard one. And that's, that's one of the ones that I think, I feel like my students struggle with, um, a lot of the time is, is how, you know, we'll play, I think that they'll play with, uh, like, the California rose, you know, wild rose. Um, I think there it's less about the plants. I mean, you know, so using yarrows, using salvias, that it, as long as it's like this really sort of lush overflowing, and then maybe there's, there's a fence or there's a low hedge of something that then it's spilling out over and that they're like climbing vines, um, you know, like a native clematis, I think would be really cool. Um, that sort of thing. It's more in how it's presented than necessarily the plants, that it's just a lot of this like overflowing and as bright as possible and sort of as packed as possible in little tight areas is how I've been doing it. Great. Uh, let's see, uh, somebody covered the name of the plant that attracts white flies, so we got caught up with that. So uh, Mary Warner is asking about, oh, birds eating the seeds. And uh, Bob Maselli and I had a conversation about that uh, the other day with the, with the wonderful golden crown sparrows that are enjoying the seeds he's put out this fall, yeah. So, yeah, what did you decide? <laughs> That's right. Put out lots. Yeah, so you can't shoot them because that's against the uh, Migratory Bird Act. Uh, right? uh, but uh, they are amazing at finding exactly where you planted the seeds and then eating them. Um, and uh, that's very expensive bird food. Yeah. <laughs> Particularly when you buy it from Theodore Payne. Oh, gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So maybe you just repeat the uh, the little the, you know their song, which is "Oh dear me." You know, you get to sing it along with them. <laughs> uh, Mary, I, I don't have an answer. I mean, you know, trying to shoo them away and trying to like there's keep adding more. I I just feel like yeah, it's it's kind of luck of the draw. I put down like a lot, hoping that I get some. Yeah, yeah. And alternatively, I guess it's just trying to grow them in another way and then transplanting them right. when they've gotten big enough. And, you know, I certainly resorted to that with some peas where um, you can use uh, rain gutter 
and you can plant in rain gutters and have those somewhere. And then you just, you, you know, you have the end off the rain gutter and you just kind of slide them out. You just kind oh, of that's... pour out. Now those are in a row. So you might want to chunk it and move some of them around. It works well for peas because you want them in a row under your- uh, oh, under But that's really good. Gutter. But uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we're down to uh, Laura. Uh, oh, so sources for lists. Yeah, so, okay, so it looks like there's, yeah, lists on the uh, Master Gardener, Marin Master Gardener website. That's awesome. And then California Native Plant Society has a bunch. Uh, Xerces Society also has some really good plant lists. Um, UC Davis Arboretum has plant lists. I mean, honestly, looking for, if there are things that you want plants for bees, just California Native Plants for Bees, typing in Google, you're gonna get a lot. I mean, and I'm also, I, I'm just trying to think, like I don't have any cool or you know innovative sources for lists. It's really just kind of anytime anyone offers me one or anytime I see one, I save it. And then, you know, and I, and I have copies too, like the nurseries. Like I know I keep talking about Annie's annuals, but like Slope Gardens, all of these places have those printed lists that, that they kind of give out at the cashiers. I use those too. And I've got a folder that's just full of that. And it's just fun to have to, to look at. Backs right. of books, right? The the um the Carol, what it Carol Ber Bornstein Gart, that has great lists at the back. Yeah. Yes, she does. Yeah. Really for good those, list. especially for butterflies, what Calscape has done on their site is you can actually identify the type of butterfly you want to attract.